Hello, and once again, this is Chrononauts. We are the science fiction literature history podcast covering amazing stories. And the first American science fiction pulp magazine. If you want more background information, please listen to the first installment of this episode because we're covering a lot of ground here and we want people to know the context. So we definitely recommend that you do listen to that even if you want to focus your attention on one of these particular authors. Our particular author right now is Leslie F. Stone and we will be talking about her two-part serial, Out of the Void. And it's my job to lead us on this weird journey that we're about to undertake. Oh boy, there's a lot to say. <laughs> but, but let's start, I guess, in the beginning. Leslie Stone was born in 1905 in the city of Philadelphia. And we don't know too much about her. She apparently started selling fairy tale type stories to newspapers at age 15 and then began to study journalism in college. She wrote 18 stories between 1929 and 1940, and I think one or two in the early 50s. And most of them were published in either Amazing or Wonder Stories, with a few late period ones going to Weird Tales. She married William Silverberg no relation to famous science fiction writer Robert Silverberg, as far as I know, in 1927, but always published stories under her given name, even if she appeared as Silverberg in the letters column of the magazine. By 1940, Stone had pretty much stopped writing science fiction, and there can be a number of reasons, perhaps, for this. By this time, she was a mother of two sons, and... To say the least, there is a lot of talk from many of the women science fiction writers from pretty much the 30s to the 70s and beyond of how society places certain demands on women and creativity always takes a backseat. And this seems to be kind of one of the stories of Leslie Stone in it. She pretty much took on the role of housewife and mother, and that's pretty much something that took up all of her time. Her story, The Cosmic Joke, is supposed to be inspired by her three-month-old son, and after that, her writing really started to slow down. In the early stages, in like 1929, 1930, 31, she was submitting several stories a year to Hugo Gernsback's magazines, but by the end of the 30s, Pretty much, people were lucky if they got one story a year from Stone. And apparently her stories were quite well-liked at the time. She said that she had run into some other problems, too. Namely, that she kind of ran out of ideas. But she also reported some extreme sexism from the editors that she attempted to deal with after Hugo and Thomas O'Connor Sloan, whom she seems to have liked very much. She reported an encounter with John W. Campbell in 1938 when he rejected her story Death Dallies a while, which ended up going to Weird Tales. According to Stone, Campbell said that he did not believe women could write science fiction and did not approve of them doing so. However, this is where I see some controversy. Campbell did publish quite a few women during his long tenure at Astounding, and he doesn't seem to have been that interested in hiding the fact that they were women or disapproving of them in the slightest. I kind of wonder if perhaps his belligerent comment was more to the effect that he didn't really like her planetary romance kind of style of writing. And unfortunately, people do have negative things to say about Campbell and his editorship, but it, there's a lot of contradictory stuff going on. Many women did praise him. Now, Samuel Delaney did comment that Campbell did not want to publish his early work. And by this time, it seems like a lot of the, and I've noticed this with it, certainly is this is a pattern early on, it seems like people are very happy to fall under his spell and go along with his kind of fathership of the golden age of science fiction and so on. But by the 1960s, he was looking kind of old and conservative and people were kind of starting to see that maybe he wasn't all that. But 
at the time that we're looking at, which is the 1930s, really. He was a trailblazer, and I don't think he was necessarily against women. Now, his thing with Delaney was definitely very strange. Sam Delaney basically said that when Campbell talked to him on the phone, he had this very, like, shitty, passive-aggressive attitude about the fact that he didn't want to accept his story. It was kind of like, yeah, you know, I really like your story, but as a black author, I don't have a problem with it, but I think the audience is not ready for that. So, I mean, a lot can be said about this man and how perhaps he has some unfortunate tendencies, but not publishing women doesn't really seem to be one of them. And Leslie Stone said she's had the same kind of treatment when she took a stab at writing for Galaxy magazine in the early 1950s. But yet again, the evidence seems contradictory. And this is where I have to point to Partners in Wonder, written by Eric Leif Davin. He goes to great lengths to attempt to disprove that there was any real prejudice against women in the science fiction community, toward writers at least. And he basically maintains that editors, authors, fans... They wanted women on board, and they liked that. And I I can kind of see why he wants to vehemently assert this, but I, I think that probably, again, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. There was, there was probably a fair bit of prejudice, but not all women felt that. And not all women were necessarily bothered by it. And not all women were like, well, he's pushing me away. You know, some of them maybe considered it a challenge. I don't know. Like, it's... So I guess my feeling with the issue of somebody like Stone or Delaney or something like that is when somebody like a Campbell doesn't like your story, he might use the sexism or racism angle to just kind of, like, further kick you with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he would be perfectly happy to publish a story by a woman if he knew it fit exactly with the scope of the magazine and he knew it would sell and and all that but if he didn't like it he just might be like a little bit more of a jerk you know and make a sexist Mm -hmm. comment towards you or make a racist comment towards you or something like that i mean i i really don't know too much about campbell and astounding i mean we'll certainly get there in a later episode but that's just kind of the sense i get from the editorial comments the nature of how people talk about these issues in the letters. Like there's some really uh, condescending and patronizing language, not again, directly dealing with women authors, but there is one letter somebody writes into amazing. And it's just like, I'm sick of all these women in our stories, you know, as (laughs) I don't care about sex at all. And the editors of amazing are like, Oh, don't worry. Amazing will never become a sex magazine. And (laughs) <laughs> it, it, it's, it's like, yeah, what, what is going through your minds here? Like, yeah, but I, I, I don't know. That that's just the kind of cursory sense that I got from scanning the fan community letters and and all that. I definitely think though that there's some layers to to all this. Like Leslie Stone, she speaks very, very highly of the editors that first accepted her in Amazing. She has nothing bad to say about them, but right. all these later editors. Of like, you know, the later science fiction magazines, she has a real problem with them. And I'm going to go on to, I mentioned Campbell, who's a spotty figure with a spotty record in a way. But Horace Gold, who's the editor of Galaxy magazine, generally was seen as a much more, like later on anyway, was seen as a much more open-minded person who really wanted to have women on his magazine. And apparently she had a problem with dealing with him as well where he basically sent her a note that said, face up to it, women should not be writing science fiction. And yet, in his very first issue, Catherine McLean, who won the Hugo for her short story in 1958, I can't remember if it was the Snowball Effect or another one, but she was a frequent contributor to Galaxy, and she, in the very first issue, she said that Horace Gold particularly called her up and practically begged her to write a story for him. And... Gold himself stated that he tried to find stories that would appeal specifically to women in every issue, which makes sense as he published over 41 stories by women during his editorship. And according to Damon Knight, author and historian and husband of writer Kate Wilhelm, who's also a science fiction writer who got her start in the late 40s, early 50s, Horace Gold was desperate to include more women authors and wished he could find more. For some reason, I just can't square this. 
And I don't really understand whether Leslie really received these comments or whether she misconstrued something or whether whether these male editors were just not consistent. Like, they just did not... Or they, they said what they didn't actually believe just to get her off their case or, like, what the deal really was. No, I'm sure she really received these comments. I think the editors were more concerned about money and mm. what sells. And I think in the case of Stone, this story we're going to be looking at tonight, to me anyway... It struck me as kind of an allegory for women's sexual awakening. And, like, mm. that's probably not what Amazing Story readers want to read. <laughs> you know, yeah, they want to read... It's not a sex magazine. Right, exactly. <laughs> they yeah. want to read the nerdy differential equations, you know, we replace resistor X with resistor but Y. But she didn't have and... a problem with... But she didn't have a problem with Amazing Magazine. She liked writing for them. They always accepted her stuff. Yeah, well, I guess what, what I'm trying to say is that, like, while they're cultivating this culture... The fan community might give them backlash in a way that the editorial, specifically Sloan, might not have. So when you get this community that expects one thing, and Sloan is this kind of old guy. I mean, at the point that this is published, he's in his, what, like late 60s, early 70s or something like that? 80s. Like, yeah, he, he, he's, he's 82 old. years old in 1930, I can't remember, but he was, he was really old by this time. Yeah. It's kind of incredible that he was still doing this, and he was doing this. And then, you know, editing the new scientific fiction magazine at his age. <laughs> I'm amazed that I pronounced it correctly the entire time I've been saying it this episode, because it's just such a bad word. We've been we've been doing all right with it, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, yeah. it's a struggle sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't roll off the tongue very well. No, it doesn't. But, you know, after yeah. Sloan and Amazing, Ziv Davis comes in, and they're like, the, you know, the big corporate guys. And I, I could see them being way more dismissive and just kind of shitty to authors like Stone on on sexist grounds. I don't think it was perceived on Stone's part. I, I think it was actual malice and bad intent and that comment that she received. Even though it does seem contradictory, I, I think the bottom line is they gravitated towards women that they could sell stories of and kind of impress their readers versus some of the stuff that Stone would have written that encompasses other themes that maybe would make readers uncomfortable or turned off by the I content. Know. I don't know. That, that, that's just kind of the sense I got anyway. But the thing is, I don't think that some of those other women were avoiding those things. I mean, I think we talk about Leigh Brackett. I think she was she was kind of avoiding those things in that she was writing like very action-oriented, macho kind of space westerns. Oh, that yeah. was just her thing. <laughs> but I don't think all those, like especially the women who wrote for Galaxy Magazine, they wanted to be confrontational. I don't think they were trying to make people comfortable, like, necessarily. I don't know. I, I, I can't quite square this. I don't... I'm kind of frustrated by the fact that she's saying this, and the evidence points to the contrary. I don't like reading some of the background research with some of the books we have during this podcast has really helped make clear to me that everybody who writes has their own bias, and Eric Leaf, David... Partners of Wonders guy. Yeah. That, yeah, he definitely has a point to prove. He wants to set out to disprove that there was heavy prejudice against women writers between the 30s and 40s and 50s. Yeah, I mean, that just seems like total nonsense. But I'm not 100% buying into it, but I'm buying into it a little more in this particular case. Because I don't really see how she could have got comments like that from editors that were more than happy to publish women who were not necessarily hey, I'm writing like a man would write, see? Like, I don't know. I just don't... There's something about this that doesn't sit right with me. I don't know. I think further research is needed on our part, and we'll definitely <laughs> do an astounding episode at some point, and, you know, probably plug into some of the other big pulp Yeah, well, and I well, definitely so. want to get into Galaxy, because that yeah. was a really interesting, uh, mm -hmm. interesting magazine. I don't know how much we want to, like, just definitely focus on the specific magazines. I'm sure we'll pull stories from them at various times. But it might be good to, to do specific episodes on those two magazines, yeah. for sure. There's a certain resemblance in this story, probably more so than something we've done on the podcast in a while. This story reminded me of one that we have already mentioned on this podcast episode, The Mummy by Jane Webb. Mm -hmm. This story gave me The Mummy vibes. On more than one occasion, just just and even in terms of the fact that the writing was very, it, it felt very amateurish, I guess, in a lot of ways. And the funny parallel was that it seems like in the 40s, when Leslie Stone kind of turned away from writing science fiction, she won some kind of prize for gardening. 
So I don't really know any details of this, but apparently that was a thing, and that was also one of Jane Webb's things. So I just oh, thought that yeah, was kind absolutely. of a, yeah. <laughs> a fun coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> Something that I notice about this, and I, again, I don't mean to put down Stone's serious commitment to like the sexual awakening of women and feminism and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, it seems like she was a very domestic person, and the woman in her story ends up following the domestic path more often than not. And it just seems, again, like what we were saying about Jane Webb and why perhaps she's not really considered the trailblazer of science fiction that, like, Mary Shelley is, is that she kind of got tied up in these super domestic things and didn't really, like... She didn't dedicate herself to writing the way Mary Shelley did, and she didn't produce a masterpiece like Frankenstein or, like some of mary shelley's other stuff and i don't know like i am interested in reading some of stone's other stuff now i have to say i picked this one on purpose her most popular story seems to be the conquest of gola which was anthologized several times and ended up in the big book of science fiction as well edited by the vandermeers along with claire winger harris's the fate of the posidonia those were the two stories that showed up from amazing magazine and i kind of thought well Golo is the more famous one, but this one is an interplanetary romance, and I I like yeah. those. Mm -hmm. And I also think we've already kind of covered feminist utopias, which which is apparently the theme of Conquest of Gola. Not that we won't want to cover them again, because we very well might, but I just kind of thought it might be more interesting to do this longer serial that's less well known. And well, I don't know. I don't know, guys, if this was the right choice. <laughs> no, I think it was, and I'll, I'll tell you why. This. It's not a good story, but it doesn't matter because it's a very interesting one. And it's an interesting one for several reasons. And I think, like a lot of other works we've covered on the podcast, that we could maybe gloss over these faults. But this really feels like three different short stories or so kind of mm -hmm. loosely stitched together. Yeah. This did not need to be a full-length novel. This could have been a couple of stories broken apart. Yeah. And there is a sequel, too. There is. That's even long. That's even longer than this. <laughs> yeah, I did not read the sequel. I, I, no. I know you said you were poking through the beginning of it. I, I started it. I didn't get very far in it. Yeah, though. right. <laughs> the theme of kind of a the hidden woman's identity. I mean, it would almost make more sense if this was from a Hanson rather than a Stone, because the mm. idea of a woman concealing her identity, pretending to be a, a man, and presenting that public persona for a while. And, you know, living this underground life and having these, I, I, I guess, feelings and thoughts and trying to preserve a public image versus, you know, what you're doing in, in a private life is, I think, a very interesting dichotomy to play and interesting topic to write upon. And she does touch upon it in a, I think, pretty compelling way in some parts, but pacing and general plotting and connecting the threads, I think, is very, very much more of an issue with this one than the, the last story we were talking about. Yeah. The individual pieces just do not gel and fit well together at all. Mm -hmm. And So this is by far the longest yeah. uh, of our stories this episode, and that's what made this the like the hardest to deal with. Like I have issues with, I guess, every story except the Wells. I kind of have issues with the and the bracket. I, I, I don't really have any issues with that. I can kind of almost put in my head a ranking of in terms of like just pro styling and in terms of actual story construction and how I feel about them. And this one would be at the bottom probably. Yeah, I would agree. It's just yeah. like, <laughs> this is the longest and it's like, it hurts more because it's the longest. <laughs> and... Yeah, because it is like, it's similar to Hanson's where it is like, there's a lot going on and there's stuff that's like introduced, but... It's almost like there's, this is where it's not fun to read. It's not like, at least with Hanson, she kind of like goes through these disjointed, more kind of afterthought things, but it feels like it's kind of like, like I said, like a sprint through it and it's yeah. kind of fun to read. In this, yeah. it's like a, a slog through things that don't really feel that connected. It's an but... unleisurely stroll, if you will. Yes. <laughs> and she's trying to yes. deal with a lot in this, to be fair. Like, there's, yeah. there's things in this story that come up as being unpleasantly racist, 
but her actual mm. attitudes are the opposite of that. Like, she wants to be yeah good yeah. about it, but, you know, it's just like... Oh, yeah. I definitely think we should talk about that, the three races and how that is handled. <laughs> yeah, uh, we will. Yeah, the whole issue of slavery that appears in the novel, and it's just yeah. kind of dealt with this, like, casual haphazardness it's like yeah oh this is just how they do it here yeah and there's almost and it's, like no internal it's strange commentary. that it's it's like there's because you know it is two installments yeah it right. almost feels like she changes her mind about yeah. it like <laughs> yeah. for the next yeah. installment yeah and we'll get into that but i really want to talk about that bit especially yeah yeah and the thing is, like, from what I've read, this is something she comes back to again, the racial thing. And and she really does want to be progressive about it. But maybe because of how she feels or the time she was writing or the fact that she, she was kind of a domestic-oriented person who maybe didn't really talk to that many people out in the world. I, re I really don't know. I mean, apparently she and her husband traveled a lot. <laughs> That's kind of something fun I want to get to a little later. But yeah. Like, she wanted to be revolutionary, I think, in a way. And mm -hmm. not just about her portrayal of women, but in other stories. She did write a story that has a black protagonist, right? Yeah. Like, I believe so. Yeah, that's right. It's mentioned in Partners of Wonder. I can't remember what the story name is. Yeah, I just, I couldn't remember the story, but I do remember that being mentioned. Yeah, I mean, she yeah. does have some interesting social commentary. And, and this one especially, I mean, the idea of, you know, concealing your identity as a woman and posing as a man for a while. In addition to this whole, like, sexual awakening thing, there is this recent-ish book that was, like, kind of a literary hoax called Awoken that was oh. written by three YouTubers and, like, some ghost writers. Oh, do tell. I don't know anything about this. Okay, yeah. So, you know, Twilight, right? The idea yeah. of, like, a paranormal romance. It was them parroting the, the genre, but except in, like, a Lovecraftian sense, you know, so the woman falls in love with a sexy Cthulhu, right? That, that's basically the whole idea. Nice. See how Moore basically wrote that story in the early yeah. 30s. Yeah, right. But <laughs> they document the entire process of writing the novel on YouTube, and they talk about the tropes and the history of, of all that stuff. And it's a really interesting thing how it goes through. And the novel itself is very funny. But they talk about this one trope, Life begins at man. So when you have a woman character who might appear on the surface to be accomplished on her own merits, in the case of this, she's very well-traveled, she's educated by the best scholars, but she just doesn't feel alive until she gets the kiss from Mr. Right or, yeah. or, or whatever. Yeah. And That's and, and, all over this. That's yeah. all over mm -hmm. this. And in, even on in Williamson, too, a little bit. Like, yeah. there's, this is yeah. a thing, for sure. Yeah. 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 And it just feels, I guess sexist when it would come from a male author but i guess disappointing when it comes from a woman author especially when she's kind of trying to make this commentary on like you know gender roles to begin with and stuff like that it just almost feels like retrogressive in a, in a way yeah i mean it wasn't i get what you're saying and i kind of agree and i that's kind of one of the reasons why i paralleled her with jane webb as well but I mean, I really do feel like we're dealing with so many different types of personalities here. Like, even all the women that we're talking about this episode, they all seem very different in some yeah. ways. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, we normally would say that, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about many different authors each episode, but it really does seem like we have to take a view that's as broad as possible and, and basically say, yeah, like, these people were all different. They all believed in different things. And I don't know. I mean, I can't help but especially after reading her letter to the magazine in 1928, which I actually want to read a little bit of now, and then I'll read a little bit more at the end when we're finished with the story. But this is a letter she wrote. I don't know when she wrote it, but it ended up in the October 1928 issue of the magazine, which is before she submitted anything. She calls this a lady reader's criticism. And this is what she says. It is a letter of Mrs. H. O. de Hart in the June issue of your publication that is the cause of my writing my little say. For more than a year I have been a reader of this magazine, and this is the first time I have seen a letter from a woman reader. In fact, I was somewhat surprised, as I had believed that I was the only feminine reader of your publication. However, it is with pleasure that I note that another of my sex is interested in science fiction. Science fiction. I feel that I owe my intense interest to this type of fiction to my mother, 
who from my baby days endeavored to develop my imagination. When I tired of my dolls, she would suggest that I play with imaginary kittens, dogs, and children of my age, and you can see how easy it was for me to progress from kittens to more imaginative subjects. It seems as if, as early as I can recall, I was reading stories such as the tales of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Jules Verne, and H.G. Wells. So, now, I want to look ahead a little bit. I mean, I, I keep doing this, but we just can't help it because everything everything we do in these episodes is kind of a, a whole piece. But I want to compare what Stone is saying to Lee Brackett's letter from 1941 and how much more, like, bold and just like, hey, I'm here, I'm going to get you all. How much more like that Lee Brackett's letter is than Stone's letter like, even Stone's letter just feels, she feels very reserved and, like, maybe even though she might want there to be some kind of revolution in the future, she's very happy living her life and she's she's kind of not necessarily wanting to go against the status quo. And especially when she talks about the covers later on, which I'm going to get to at the end. Oh, that part's great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, it just kind of seems like she doesn't want to rock the boat that much. Like, yeah. she's kind of, like, even when she's yeah. talking about her childhood, like, it just seems very um, staid and kind of a little bit, like, prudish and ultra-normal, almost. Like, again, I don't mean to look down on her that much, but, like, it just, it doesn't really seem like she's going to take the world by storm with her imagination kind of thing, where the way Brackett seems determined to try to do. And, I don't know, like... I feel like maybe she was too easily discouraged. Like, again, maybe she did receive some shitty comments. And if she had been somebody of a different character, maybe she would have just said, well, fuck it. That just gives me reason to keep on. Right. Uh, but she doesn't seem to be that kind of person, and she just decided to live a different life. No, I, I get the sense that she was fairly socially conservative in the way she conducted yeah. herself. I mean, just based on what she describes in that letter. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's just a fascinating sociological snapshot of the time and of her as a person. I have to say one of the best things about this episode was pulling out these letters. I'm so glad we decided to do mm. that because yep. I really, really feel like from reading what people had to say, the fans, but also the writers themselves who often wrote into the letter columns before they actually wrote a story, what they had to say about the magazine, what they had to say about how they perceive things and so on. And that makes it so much more interesting. And that's the kind of background that we haven't had from any of our authors before, even the ones that wrote biographies of themselves. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to end off with that. I don't really have anything else to say about Stone's biography. If you guys have any more general thoughts about this particular story before we get into the summary, I guess now's the time to go into it. I kind of been pretty vocal about apologizing for the fact that I chose this one. Because <laughs> this was a hard read at times. There was some really bad writing in this story. Um, so this wasn't my favorite <laughs> that we've covered on the podcast, but at the same time, it's not my least favorite of all the stories we've covered. I mean, sure. I it, it's longer than it needed to be. It has some dismal pacing problems that I'm sure we'll cover shortly. But there's a lot of interesting ideas here, and yeah. there yes. are some cool scenes. And... I don't think it was a bad pick in that, again, it really does capture a certain aspect of the genre of the fandom and how the magazine was progressing at the time in many different ways, in the way it covered longer stories, in the way it covered gender issues, in the way it covered interplanetary travel. Like, there's a lot going on here, and I don't have any complaints with this one, even if it's not like a great or even good novel. Yeah, I agree where this is definitely not the most egregious thing that we've read. And I don't really think it's like the worst thing that we've read. I do agree that there are some good concepts in there that I don't think they connect. I think that's the problem is they don't connect very well. Yeah. But besides that, I think that if they had been explored separately, there wouldn't have been as much of a problem. A lot of my comments relate more specifically to certain aspects of the text, so I I think it would be better for me to hold those for when we get, okay. get into it. 
Yeah, that's fair. I don't know. I, I kind of feel a little different. I, I almost feel like the idea behind this story is fine. It's the execution that I'm not fond of. I don't I don't really like the way she strings things together, but not in terms of like the plot, but just in terms of overall just constructing a appealing paragraph. Like it just seems like something is missing and sometimes it's really bad. Yeah, I don't know. I feel way worse making you read that Frank Reed Steam Man novel than any of this, so don't feel bad yeah. about it. <laughs> I guess so. You're right. I mean, I mean, I I will say that, and I, I that is something that I did observe earlier, and that I do think on the whole this is certainly an improvement from those dime novel kind of things. Like even the worst of this yeah. era is a little bit better than that, which is yeah. nice, but. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like, and, I, and again, this feels bad because it, it's, it almost seems like I'm saying if she had just got a man to help her out, but I don't think it necessarily needed to be a man. It could have been anybody. If she had a collaborator who was a bit more more attuned to style and a bit more attuned to like just smoothing out some of the rough edges, this could have been more awesome than it is. Like I really think that the ideas are good, but... The execution is faulty, and I, I think that it really hurts this a lot for me. There are some bits that are unintentionally funny, but in general, like, it wasn't funny enough to be like, yeah, I, I kind of, I don't know that I can really recommend this to the average person. Like, you know, right. if you're interested in the history of it, sure, read this. But, like, if you're not, if you just want to hear me go to town on this a little bit, then, or possibly all of us, <laughs> then just listen to the podcast and don't read the story, I guess, because I, I can't recommend this. I sort of groaned my way through this a little bit. I sort of started with the best of intentions, and there were definitely things that I liked about it. Like I said, I think the ideas were really sound. I just think that the the way it was executed was just, it kind of, again, I have to think, to, to think of somebody that Stone really liked because she mentioned Abraham Merritt in her letters as well. She wanted to see Merritt reprints. And I just think, I kind of think, like, again, it feels bad because I'm, like, saying, well, if a man had taken this over, but I'm not really saying that, but I'm just saying, like, if somebody had, like Merritt, had written this story, I think it would have been more colorful and more engaging and more, like, yeah, I would have enjoyed especially the second half a lot more. Well, even somebody like Lee Brackett, I mean, yeah. the difference between the two stories here is the pacing here with Stone is, like, dreadful and it just doesn't have any kind of sense of tension or building up those kind of elements where bracket she's got you hooked from like the first paragraph yeah and i read bracket immediately after finishing this and it did feel oh, wow. like yeah. a breath of fresh air yeah. it was like yeah. being launched like the pacing is like such a a great oh, yeah. speed and it yeah. just launches you right into the action yeah yeah it's such I mean, a remarkable change yeah yeah bracket is like go 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 yeah and she's like i want everybody to think at every moment of this story this is badass or these people are badass yeah. or like there's none of that here in fact there's actually this i should have mentioned this when we were talking about her possible social conservatism but there's a religious thing in this story as well there's a vein of christianity and mm. like kind of definitely throughout this it's not like super super blatant all the time but she mentions god like many times yeah there's one weird thing at the very beginning that i was trying to figure out if it was a biblical reference so there's a rocket ship called the yod Verrill, right mm -hmm. and when we did the nervo story soul giver it spells out like these Hebrew letters in the text, and one of the Hebrew letters is Yod. And I yeah. tried to look up if like Veril was another Hebrew letter, like if she's trying to say something with that, and it's not. But it, it just seems the YV. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. It, it, it seems like it's some kind of like she was trying to go for that with the either the imagery or the the wording, but. I don't know if that's exactly what she was getting at there. There's a few other things like that in this story where she's talking about, like, the aliens and the language that they use and stuff, where she talks about the names, and she gives them names like the, or something or other, which means, yeah. like, the, the greater, you know, the super thing, right? Where it's right, like, yeah, yeah. she's obviously thinking of, like, Indo-European languages, and, and yeah, maybe Yodvaro is a reference to Hebrew or something, like, yeah. I mean, Hebrew is not Indo-European, but it definitely has a biblical tradition throughout, like, 
Western names, I guess, and this weird like Kabbalah mysticism that Nervo picked up on. And I, I, I don't know if that was really Stone's thing. She doesn't really get into the, like the mysticism, spiritualism, weird angle here that much. Even though there is like the whole telepathy thing, which yeah. Um, yeah is a thing in science fiction for several decades after, but it is one of those more like weird fictiony elements of it that you would think the magazine would try to discourage if they're going. For, like, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of weird fiction stuff in this. Really, it's just yeah, not expressed that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it seemed like. Well, we'll point them out when we get there, but it just seems like there's a lot of. She's really speaking to all three of the major categories in this story. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely an attempt to address all of them, for better or worse. I mean, I, I don't know that it works that well, but it's all there. There's the science, there's the weird angle, and there's also the interplanetary romance, very much so. Oh, definitely. And yeah. <laughs> the whole second half has this weird, like, court intrigue kind of, it, it almost yeah. reminds me of, like, The Coming Race by Bulwer Lytton. Like, a little bit where it's, like, kind of getting into this, like, weird intrigue between all the people on this planet and, like, how our visitor character from Earth is sort of intertwined with all this. And... Yeah, you get the whole mm -hmm. love parallelogram and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see. What's this story about? Our narrator describes himself as a simple man who knows and cares nothing about outer space. And he hints of a visitation from an alien sphere and jokes about a fish story as it all began on a fishing trip he embarked upon one day. Getting away from the hubbub of New York City. Somewhere in New Jersey. Yeah, so, somewhere in rural New Jersey. If you are... At all up on your New Jersey geography, which, why wouldn't you be? You will notice that the <laughs> land right outside of New York City is perhaps the same area that they filmed the Toxic Avenger in. So if you've ever seen that film, picture That's that. close to where you live. Not that close, but no. within a comfortable drive, I would say. But yeah, picture the Toxic Avenger in the background for these early scenes, and I think you'll have a good idea. <laughs> well... He seems to like going on these spontaneous trips, and he has a wife, and she's okay with him just phoning at night randomly and saying, oh, I'll just be gone for two or three days. So he gets to his shack and finds someone's been there and stolen his suit of clothes, and they left this amazing ruby in his place. <laughs> it's a reasonable exchange, I guess. And... <laughs> He also seems to have a new neighbor. There's this strange glass structure nearby that wasn't there before. So, the new structure is a large cylindrical space trap torpedo thing. And it's landed there rather than being built there, obviously. And oddly, the first thing he thinks to do is scratch or break it. <laughs> it seems to be made of clear glass, but nothing will so much as scratch it. So there's not even a break or a weak point in any of the surface. But he finally gets tired of throwing shit at the cylinder, and he resolves to ask about it in the nearby village. 
And he's just setting out when something leaps screaming out of the forest and tackles him. And he catches a glimpse of a weird face with cat-like eyes before something hits him in the head and he loses consciousness. And he wakes inside a room with unfamiliar plants and artistic depictions of nature and cityscapes on the walls. And he's inside the cylinder thing now. And he freaks out and overworks himself and passes out again. And his collarbone is fractured. So he awakes being surveyed by a tall, statuesque man shape with silver skin and unfamiliar garments. And he explains that his servant was overzealous in his duty. But Riley comments that our man was meddling. Yeah, and I have to say, I was really into the story at this yeah. point. Yeah. It's the mystery of the glass cylinder. You know, ooh, where's this going to lead? And the way she does it is pretty cool. You know, she does draw you in and you get this like neat but silly mystery. But she really shifts gears on you pretty shortly. And <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really thought that the opening of the story kind of followed some interesting tropes. And I kind of thought, oh, there couldn't have been much before this that was like that. And yeah. whereas like, mm. here's the alien on Earth. He's already here. And this guy's kind of an interloper. And what's the alien going to do with him? And like, you know, it, it kind of feels ahead of its time a little bit, I think. Yeah. So I, I like that, too. And the host slash captor announces that they come from a planet as yet undiscovered by humanity at the edge of the solar system. This is a spaceship or ship of the void. And it's the stranger can speak perfect English because someone or Earth has already been out into the void before. And the alien's mission is secret. They need to make contact with a certain individual, and we're hoping to be gone within a few days. They deliberately chose a secluded spot that was relatively close to New York City. And the narrator is the only person to have discovered the ship in the glade. And they had to capture him to prevent him from bringing intruders upon them. So, the ship is indeed the Yod Verl, and there are the two silver-skinned travelers and their gold-skinned servant. Sadak, the older of the silver men, tells our man, whom he treats like a guest, that he may punish the servant for injuring him. Uh, no, that's okay, says our narrator. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I don't need to punish you. <laughs> and our man seems not only resigned to his fate but very curious and content to remain among the aliens the Abruians who say they'll return him to his place of origin when they are finished with their mission the whole tone that the whole slavery issue is presented throughout the entire story even though it, it I guess does change to portray the slaves in a more positive light and kind of sort of maybe condemn slavery at the end like yeah it just feels off yeah kind of wonder what leslie was thinking about when she was writing this yeah my personal feeling is that leslie was very much against it but that she perhaps due to her upbringing and her own maybe slightly conservative mindset she can't help but be very casual about it. Like, she can't help but be kind of like, yeah, there's slavery. And, like, even when she, later on, she talks about them going to Africa, and she's like, oh, and this is with the Negro quarters, and this is, right. like, you know, so, it's just very casual and very, like, I think she means better than that, but I think she just can't help herself, kind of. I think that's just kind of the way it is. Yeah. yeah. Definitely does not sit well in the modern day, that's for sure. <laughs> and I think that it's, in the second part, there is this effort to kind of, yeah, like portray them in a sympathetic light and to kind of bring up that, hey, this is a bad thing. But yeah. but because she starts out the story with this hint of slavery still continuing. Oh, that too, yeah. It's like, oh, she can't really do anything about it because near the end of the story, there's an attempt at a revolt and... And it takes her, like, a really long time for her to get there to portray the slaves in a sympathetic light. Yeah. You know, like, a yeah. really long time. Yeah, and... it does feel maybe like, it, like, I again, it feels like she kind of, like, had this thought after writing a whole bunch of the story <laughs> that she's like, wait, maybe this isn't 
a good thing. <laughs> Maybe this is something that I should address, and it happens too late. I think she kind of has a kind of an inbuilt sort of thing where it's like, this is, it's not necessarily a good thing, but this is the, the way things are. And she's fighting against it, but at the same time, when she starts out, she can't help but just be like, yeah, this is the way things are. And when she portrays the Abruins, she makes sure that we know. And this is one of the things that I liked about the story. A lot of the stuff that I've read from this time of this kind of thing, which was like published in Amazing, not necessarily like Abraham Merritt. Merritt was a little different. He was a little bit more, I don't know, more otherworldly, more romantic, I guess. Like he kind of, his stories came off differently. Like there was weird science in the stories, but that was never the emphasis. But with some of these stories, I was talking about Harry Bates, who ended up being the editor of Astounding in like the early 30s. I think he contributed to Amazing early on too, but definitely like one of the stories that I read, it was kind of like this, these people are in this weird, I can't remember if it's like some part of South America or Africa or something like that, and they find like a base of an alien civilization, and this alien civilization is like awesome, they're the best alien civilization, they're very advanced, they're very sophisticated, they're pretty much better than humanity in every way, and we should follow their example because they're cool. Stone's not really saying that. She's actually saying the opposite. This is a fallen race. This is, again, going with her biblical thing, because she seems to have a little bit of a religious angle. The Abruins are, in some ways, they're to be respected and admired, but they're a fallen race, and they're an example of a race that needs to be sort of helped to pick themselves up again, which... Again, could be considered condescending, I guess, because she's kind of including the gold-skinned people in that as well. Whereas, they, like, they used to be in a position of greatness, but now they're not. And now they need this person from Earth to kind of help them along and get them back to where they should be. Yeah, the whole white savior thing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. I mean, didn't have to be a white person, but I guess I guess so, yeah. I guess it is basically an example of that. Yeah, I mean, it's coded that way, basically. I mean... yeah. And yeah. I feel like they do kind of connect, because on Earth, they mention that he's, like, there to help the African people. So it's almost like it parallels with what he was doing on Earth, where it's like, ah, uh, yes, he's here to, to save this oppressed race. Yeah, the Bruins have some cool gadgets, but they're still in need, like, even silver-skinned advanced people are also in need of help. They're the real fallen ones in this, which I think adds a little bit of an an interesting extra twist to it is it's not just slave race that needs the help of the saviors. It's the everyday civilized people of Abrui as well. They might have the cool radium gadgets, but they've got a lot of problems that they need to deal with. <laughs> and I do like how radium gadgets play a large part in this. I mean, they use it yeah. for everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a big thing in real life as people used radium for a lot of things and it turned out it wasn't such a good idea <laughs> yeah and she acknowledges that but she says yeah. the aberrants know how to do it right but yeah yeah still I we'll mean, get the, to that the whole radium girls was a very big mm. yeah <laughs> big yeah. thing <laughs> yeah so our guy wanders around the ship and he finds a brewing books as well as something written in english this is a message of sorts to a professor ezra rollins from Dana Gleason about the Rollins rocket having landed successfully on Abrui. Dana Gleason's name is familiar, and we get a strange story about how this rich society man married into another wealthy family, but spirited away their son on a fancy yacht just before the wife was killed in an accident. And he brings up his kid to hate women, and this is definitely significant. So... They seem to do every kind of adventure imaginable, and finally, they join the British Army, and Gleason <laughs> Sr. is killed. It's like, whoa! <laughs> All this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And after you've done everything you could possibly do, you join the British Army. You die in World War I. You know, you get yeah. It's like World you've done War everything I. possible. Time to join the British Army. Yeah. Yeah. What a, it's just such a weird part in the story and like the, yeah this puzzled me more than like i think anything else in, in in the novel like the whole i guess misogyny angle is because at this point you don't know well i guess i've 
I don't want to spoil it, but yeah, because it's the one major surprise of the book. Yeah, right. I didn't. I didn't see that coming. I was like, whoa, what? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he's treating the kid so. to be like this total misogynist, and you're like, wait, that's that's a bit much, don't you think? Like, and I don't know, it, Mary Sue kind of trope where. The kids getting all of the best of tutors, the best of education, the maxing out all of his stats. Right. Yeah. Everything that money could possibly buy, he's going to be the most intelligent, charming person on the face of the planet. And then, yeah, you know, let's march against the Germans and get blown apart in World War One. It's a like, what? Oh, okay. Yeah, really. And, and it comes in later, too, where I kind of question all that with some of the developments in the second half of this story. I'm just like, really? That's that's what... <laughs> yeah. So The son does really well in the Air Force, but nothing has heard of him for quite a while. After that aside. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was that. Uh, maybe we'll, maybe that'll be significant later. I mean, yeah. of course it will, right? But we'll stick a pin in I don't know. I don't really know how to pick that up. There's no good segue. It's just like <laughs> the ship, then the ship sets off. Yeah, she she's a very awkward author. I mean, like the way she transitions between stuff and plot threads is just like mm. not well handled at all. And I mean, yeah. it is kind of charming, but at the same time, this work is about 40,000 words versus like a 3,000 word short story. So it does yeah. kind of <laughs> tend to hit you a little harder than some of the other things that we can maybe brush off. And, and again, I, I feel like, I, again, I could have chosen something by her that was shorter, that was probably maybe better. Like No, I, 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 you know, I don't, don't blame know, yourself. But... I mean, I like talking about these works uh, more than I like reading them, in a sense, if that makes sense. Like, I, I'm glad <laughs> yeah, yeah. we read this work Same. because it's fun to talk about. And <laughs> even though it is awkward in places like this, I think it does have a lot of cool things going for it that are fun to look at. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. So all the lights are extinguished and the Abruins can see in the dark. So they're going to Africa to deliver the report to Professor Rollins. This is the report of what happened to the previous expedition, I guess, that ended up on Abri. So then there is a description of the ship's pilot room and their four hour trip. And there's vague talks of radium motors. And they settle in South Africa somewhere between Cape Town and Johannesburg. And it's the professor's house at one in the morning. But that's okay. It's not every night aliens come to call. So Sadak, the alien, shows off his unbreakable glass. And there's 40 layers of it to protect them from vacuum and stuff. And there doesn't seem to be mass production on their world as he talks about doing this himself. So, like, initially my thought was, oh, this is a spaceship that was made that I guess he just got somehow. But apparently he built all this, possibly based on the model of Roland's ship. Because and so, this yeah. is, again, this is a cool thing that I liked about this story was that the Abruins are not superior. Like, they, they have some cool ship. And this seems to be part of the sequel as well. The little bit I read of it was that they want to establish proper trade between Earth and Abrui, where the two cultures can kind of share things and benefit one another. And it, it seems like they're both in need of that. Like, they could use the other very much so. Yeah. Oh, I also did want to say about this part that they do mention, I just thought it was very fun that they were like, yeah, we were watching you when you were trying to scrape through our, our ship. And we were all, like, laughing about it and thought it was really funny. I just liked that bit quite a bit. I thought that was a fun bit. You can really put <laughs> yeah. yourself in their shoes, too. I mean, 40 layers of glass and somebody's on the outside, you know, trying yeah, to... Just, like, you know, has, like, a rock. Yeah. <laughs> just, like, this stone that they're trying to break your, your ship with. Yeah, and I think this is kind of one of the perhaps unintentionally funny things about this story is that a lot of the story is told by one of the Abruins, and he's kind of, like, every now and then he'll pause to, like, explain something, like the 40 <laughs> layers of glass or, like, the super radium food heating dishes or something like that but then when they ask him about like important details of the story he'll be like oh it's really late now i don't really feel like getting into this <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's really <laughs> one of my favorites is after all this information is revealed and they're like well what happened next he's like well let's take a swim first yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah no, we'll get to that that has that has one of the 
so this this story definitely has a lot of awesome gazing upon really <laughs> well oiled, sexy male bodies <laughs> and like how great they look. And it, it's kind of one of the things where I didn't really expect to see this in Amazing Magazine. Like I kind of thought maybe there would be some of that about the female body, but I didn't really expect to see so much like look at the awesome muscular male physique and like all the oil and yeah <laughs> like there's a lot of that in here yeah i think this is really <laughs> the only story this episode where sexuality has gone into in like any kind of meaningful degree and it's kind of present throughout mm-hmm. which is i guess interesting in the way that the culture of the magazine developed yeah i mean we're also in the 20s here which was a reasonably permissive time in terms of that like compared to like even the 40s or 50s, probably, a little bit. Yeah, especially if you look at the mm-hmm. film at that time. I mean, yeah. pre-code stuff is definitely a lot more risque than 40s stuff or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So Professor Rollins had sent two men to Mars, Dana Gleason and Richard Dore. And they had reached a brewery instead. So how did this happen? Well, this is the message that the aliens came to deliver. The professor lives in the African outback with his niece. He had assumed the men were dead and was haunted by guilt. We get the story of the past imparted by the niece, apparently, though we don't see it like that. It's it's kind of weirdly told again. Like, it's, I don't know, there's like a million different angles that you could have chosen to tell this story with. And it's an interesting way to read this. Like, this is what I always do when I read stuff. And it's, so it's not like I'm picking on stone in particular, but I'm always like, How would I like to tell this story? I think this is one of the most interesting aspects of reading or watching fiction is actually seeing how you might do it differently and how you might like say, hey, this particular angle of the story is really, really interesting. And Gretchen and I have been watching Blake 7. And one of the cool things about that show is that I always find that there's other ways you could tell the story. Not that the way they choose to tell the story is bad, but it's just like they're leaving it open for you to see a different way that you could write the story. And where you're like, yeah, I could focus on this particular angle. And there's a lot of that in this. Like, there's a lot of, there's so much going on and there's so much like, I kind of want to focus on this particular aspect. But Stone's not going to do that. Stone's going to just kind of fly all over the place and (laughs) do whatever. So I'm glad you mentioned Blank 7, and I'm glad you both are watching that again. I would like to watch that again. Yeah, we we'll probably, I want to bring up Blake 7 again when we talk about No Man's Millennium in Space. Yes, I was about to mention that because that could easily, easily be a Blake 7 story. Yeah. Oh, yeah, which is really cool, but yeah. we're a ways from bracket yet. We still, are, yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> we really have a lot to chew this episode. This is yeah, I, I, I gotta say, yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for for putting up with this episode. This is a big one. But Rollins was laughed at when he said he could build a rocket to Mars. So he went into isolation to work in secret and also questioned around to find the perfect astronaut. And he finds him and Dana Gleason Jr., who has done everything that can be done on Earth at 26 years of age. Imagine that. So Dana had simple instructions. Get to Mars. Build a radio with a big antenna. Broadcast a receiver in Roland's attic. There's probably intelligent life on Mars. <laughs> they're, they're just sort of assuming that. Yeah, th- that's another thing actually that I think is really interesting across all these stories is when they discuss other planets, including the moon. There's yeah. always the possibility of life and intelligent life on all of them. Like, mm-hmm. it seems like virtually nothing is known about the atmospheres and the geology of the planets of the solar system during this time and that it was still an open question of what's out there and i don't think it can be overestimated how when it kind of was revealed what the planets in the solar system were really like how much disappointment there was (laughs) yeah like yeah how much it's lifeless rock really (laughs) that really sucks that means we're all alone (laughs) out here yeah like it's really (laughs) And and in a way, I think I'd like to cover that in a very specific way on a future episode, but it meant the death of a lot of these kind of planetary romance sort of stories. Yeah. It's really unfortunate because they're a lot of fun to read sometimes. Like, there's a lot that's better than this one. And once you kind of discover that every planet in the solar system is probably 
pretty much incapable of supporting any kind of life. And then you kind of think, well, what's the likelihood of planets elsewhere in the galaxy supporting life? We're going to come up against so much that's barren. It might be interesting from a scientific perspective, but there's no life here. It's a horrible thing to contemplate, you know, that just didn't really start getting contemplated seriously until like the 1950s or 60s. Yeah. So all this that Rollins expects Dana to be able to do, it's weird. Like, it's weird that he expects all that, but I guess he does. And then there's really weird descriptions of Dana, his physicality, his moods, his temperaments changing with the weather, his anger. He looks like he's going to be the romantic lead of some awesome, I don't know. It's weird the way she takes a lot of time to describe this. It's quite interesting, especially what we discover about Dana later on and out here at this point i kind of very misled about things and i thought that professor rollins niece whose name i still elsie yeah Mm. she i kind of thought oh maybe she loves him or something like that but then there's a very loving description of richard door as well the (sighs) rollins neighbor and maybe it's leslie stone doing the loving really so he's quite a hunk (laughs) of a fellow like a big viking and there's some condescending language about his humanitarian deeds towards the people of Africa. Basically, like, this guy's going to help them sort themselves out because they really need his help. And actually, I can see how I think she's trying to be positive about this. Like, she's like, they've been exploited for so long. Of course, they need somebody's help, right? And I, I don't know. I get it. I think she's being well-intentioned, but it just still comes off as a little bit condescending here. Yeah. Else, yeah. So Richard... And here I'm thinking, like, again, I was very confused about what was what. I'm, like, writing down in my notes, Richard loves Elsie, Elsie loves Dana. Is that what we're going to guess, right? (laughs) It's like... Yeah, Yeah, just an average love triangle. Nothing too strange about that. Yeah, that's definitely something that threw me. Like, I had no idea where this part was going. So, obviously, there's a problem with all this. It's the Earth rocket, so it's big. It's very big, this rocket. And the description of some stuff inside. The details very, very specific and very clunkily focused on weird things. We even get a mention of toothpaste? I don't know. It's... (laughs) Her description of, like, how the rocket is stocked up just seems very strange. Like, her decision to focus, again, on very domestic things. Like, it just... Yeah. I don't know. It, I don't yeah, it, it feels like it is, like, just the inside of a house. Yeah. The perfect house where two people will be isolated for a very long time. And it's weird. And, and, and again, I had to highlight the focus on the toothpaste. Like, like the toothpaste <laughs> just seems so strange. <laughs> There's a last supper for the man going out to the realm of the god of the void i dig that it's very well done actually so there's no sign of richard though and he's absent dan is provided with all the things including cigarettes booze and stimulants so at the last moment richard door does show up on horseback and barges into the ship the professor might not even notice as he presses the liftoff lever and it's like the explosion in From the Earth to the Moon as the ship is catapulted off into space. And several people are injured and two killed. Yeah, so. and it's just like such an offhand comment. It's like, yeah, two techs were killed, you know, no big deal, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <Yeah>. Science. <laughs> yeah, and it's like also Rollins has like such guilt yeah. over what happened to uh, Dana and Richard. And it's like, also other people died, but yeah. I guess he doesn't really care <laughs> <Yeah>. about that. <laughs> it's like literally never mentioned again. Like, yeah, they're just two techs, you know, we could replace them. Yeah. yeah. But we have to know what happened to Dana. I have yeah. to know that Dana's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really strange. <laughs> but we go back to Rollins reading the manuscript, and in a nice touch... He's unsatisfied. He thinks the account should be more personal and more emotional. And he wants the real story. And here is where I start thinking that Bill from the Prince of Space needed to be in on this particular trip. But (laughs) we're not there yet. So (laughs) Sadak the Abruian says that he has in his desk, he has Dana's diary. Well, that would indeed seem to be interesting to Rollins. And he wants to know how the two men are supposedly content now, which Sadak maintains is the truth. 
He says, yes, he'll explain, beginning with some of the Bruin technology. So here's where he starts to show off some of that stuff. We begin with a domestic situation being described. He's describing the Abluian living room, complete with warning swim. And several scenes are described. The Bruins have slavery, and they seem to think it's okay. And Tor, the younger pilot, appears to wear women's fashion for some reason. And there's a description of cooking and eating vegetable-type things. And they have cattle, too. But they speak with them. They're like... I don't know. It, it kind of makes me think of that scene in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Actually, it's in the restaurant of the end of the universe, the second part, where they meet the dish of the day. Yeah. And the dish of the day is like telling them what parts are the best. And <laughs> the girl's like really horrified. And she's like, do you mean this animal wants us to eat it? And the other guys are horrified that she says that because they're like, oh, you mean you would like the animal to be like not wanting to be? That's that's <laughs> <laughs> that's just the worst. But I don't know. The uh, Bruins are just more enlightened that way. So. Yeah, and Elsie responds just like that way. Like, she responds like Trillion, that's the girl's name, in Restaurant in the End of the Universe. But, wait, the Abruians don't eat their fresh. They just they just drink the milk. And, okay, so, like, at first I didn't realize that that was really what was happening, but, I don't know, it was almost like she was setting that up, and then she's like, no, 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 it's not as bad as you think. But the animals are euthanized when they can't provide any more, and... Also, they do this to humans, too, by the way. But it's not called killing. It's just going to sleep by a certain ray. And he admits they don't know anything about the soul. So, again, it's because they're a fallen race. They need the help of humans. They need specifically the help of godly humans. And I think that that's a theme in this. Even though it's not overly, overly stated, it's very much here. So... Yeah. Now we finally get the diary, excerpts read by Elsie, and it turns out that Dana is a woman, and this is where we find out. Yeah. And Richard is with her, and everything we thought we knew is wrong. So it was actually a real surprise to me that this happened. I didn't read anything about this story ahead of time. I didn't know that this was going to happen, and I was like, oh, wow, okay. Like, all these things I was trying to pinpoint, I usually predict these stories pretty well, and I'm kind of like trying to pinpoint it and going, oh, so I think I know what's happening now. It's going to be this kind of love triangle. Uh, no, it's not really. Not really. So this threw me off, too. And yeah, I thought that like Elsie having a crush on Dana would play out in a different way. And like yeah. the way she reveals like her gender is like, oh, she could have to deal with like this whole homoerotic thing as like a issue. And it just like never comes up again <laughs> throughout the rest of the story. Not yeah. really, no. <laughs> there is sort of this hint of homoeroticism between Richard and Dana, though, because there is this one line where Richard was like, even before I knew you were a woman, I was like attracted to you. Yeah, right. And I was kind of <laughs> yeah. in love with you. And it's like only this really small, like in passing line. But I, yeah. I was thinking like, that's that's kind of interesting that that's a part of this. Yeah. So it's still kind of a thing, but I was just once she kind of got it out of the way, it was gone. Yeah. But it was acknowledged a little bit, I think. So there's that. But Dana talks about this crazy guy also who was threatening. He was going to expose her nature. And he's like, marry me or I'll expose you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you obviously really love me, right? Yeah. Um, we see that again later. But Richard guessed the truth and was concerned about her. And even if Earlier on, she, he was kind of asking if she would back out. And, of course, she said no. And so now Richard and Dana are alone in space. And they're weightlessly tumbling in the ship. At first, she foresees funny results. And she's upset at first about this whole thing. But eventually, grows to like the idea of him being there with her. It's a lot less lonely, for one thing. I remember they're headed for Mars at this point. And... She takes stock of their supplies, and she writes in her diary about how she's never had a confidant except for her little book. And she hopes Mars doesn't know about yellow journalism, which I thought was a really amusing comment, actually. <laughs> and 
I mean, as hard as I am on Leslie Stone here, I, I do think there's a lot of potential for her to be really good. And I kind of wish... I mean, I, I will maybe read some of her late period stories and see how they are and wish she continued because this isn't all bad. And, like, we're going to get to an author later, again, Jack Williamson, who's just getting a start around that time and who is generally considered to have improved a lot from his early days. So, I mean, it does take time and practice to get better. And I think that we have to acknowledge that Amazing Stories, in a lot of ways, was a magazine for amateur writers, in fiction at least, in a lot of cases. These writers were not established, well-respected writers when they were writing for this magazine. Because if they would have been, they would have not written for this magazine. Pretty right. much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the two of them sleep apparently fully clothed in each night. Uh, <laughs> I love how she specifies it too. <laughs> yeah, there's a, interesting descriptions of the domesticity involved yeah. here. So they smoke cigarettes in the rocket all yeah. the time, and they alternate cooking and dish doing. Very domestic arrangement all around. So fifty thousand miles an hour is their speed at at this point. And not going too fast, considering the vastness of space. But the journey is supposed to take 23 days. And we obviously know something's going to go wrong. And Dana has a lot of time for reflection. And she maybe has been missing out on this womanhood thing, she decides. So maybe her father was wrong in his hatred of women. Richard's a great guy. More admirable than she, in some ways, she thinks... What does God think of them now? She also wonders. Now they're quickly approaching Mars, and their speed keeps increasing, much faster than estimated. This could be a problem. Indeed, the Martian gravity does not touch them, and they totally overshoot the planet. They think they glimpse trees and grass, but it's uncertain. Much despair now. Maybe they can somehow land on another planet. So... Here's where we begin the second part of the story, which yeah. was published in the next month's October issue. Yeah, they, they leave it on the cliffhanger with them overshooting Mars. Yes. Now we're not certain how things are going to go for them. Doesn't it also end, like, the last bit is, and then dot 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 <laughs> or something? It's very, yeah. like, cliffhanger typical yeah. language. You have to wait till next month. <laughs> it's cliffhanger as far as them overshooting Mars and like what happens between Dana and Richard. They use a sentence, who could have said that Dana Gleason should be happy in discovering her womanhood? You know, there's this like whole sexual tension between the two and it, yeah. it, it kind of plays out in her whole awakening, and we'll see in just a little bit. And again, I can see how this could have been done really well. The situation as it is, is quite fascinating. I feel the allure of the situation, but I also feel how it could have been done in a more engaging way. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, I really do feel the sexual tension, and I really do feel like these two, how are they going to handle this? They've overshot the planet. What now, right? Like, it's just, it's not quite as powerful as it could be but it's there it's there so i gotta give it some credit for that so before we start part two i just like to point out right here because i think this is a good time to point it out there's a lot of things we can complain about with this story like the pacing and the length and everything like that one thing i will say the narrator character has nothing to do with anything has no purpose whatsoever and totally 100 percent doesn't need to be here. yeah i i was so frustrated with this because like <laughs> I like the setup, I like the mystery, and then, yeah, the whole narrator plotline is completely ditched from this point onward. It yeah. serves no purpose whatsoever. And <laughs> He's got nothing to do, yeah. he's got no name, he never goes to the planet, yeah. he never, like, yeah. you know, there's, there's no purpose for him being here. And the yeah. thing is, she sets up all these things where she's like, here's the diary, here's Elsie Rollins, here's, like... Any of those things could tell all of the story, but they just don't, right? Like, it's just, I don't know. It's, yeah. there's so much unnecessary stuff in here. And even going far back to early on, again, I have to highlight him because he's one of our authors. So we look for letters featuring him. Jack Williamson was saying, I think some of the novel length stories in this magazine are too long. I like the short stories. I don't think that his 
entry in this podcast episode is the second longest, but it doesn't feel like it has as much wasted baggage as this story does. It does have one key narrative flaw that I will point out when we get to it, but I think that it really doesn't waste as much time as this story does, and there's a lot going on. So, with a comparison between the two, this one is about 40,000 words. The Williamson is like 28, 29,000 words, so it's maybe like 75% of the length. The Williamson I read all the way through in one sitting. This one took me like five or six different sittings (laughs) sittings to get through, I I, want to say. Yeah, yeah same. this one took yeah. me like all the other readings took me one sitting. This yeah. one took me like three. Yeah, I mean, again, it would have worked for like three or four different short stories, like the whole narrator introduction of the mystery of the rocket. Then this bit here, where they overshoot the planet and they're stuck on the rocket, and like you know, what are we gonna do now? You know, like our food's running out, like our supplies are running out. We only have a short time to live, and then you know, we'll go into the next bit in a little bit but i think they could have all been handled separately and explored different themes and worked on their own rather than just kind of being all shoved together in one yeah. narrative because like mm-hmm. this part in particular i think has a lot going for it even if it's kind of incoherent in it's, in yeah, it's messaging agree. and stuff like that mm-hmm. like she really makes a lot of effort to ensure you that yes they're fully clothed the whole time and no they're not having sex at all why would you ever think that uh and (laughs) despite despite what happens later (laughs) yeah right and like that triggers this whole like psychological and like spiritual awakening in her and she finds god yeah right and it just then the whole bit that happens on the planet, it just seems like, I, I don't know, I guess we'll get there, but it, it's very disconnected and disparate parts mm-hmm. that just, like, just don't mesh. Yeah. Yeah, it's like those would be interesting on their own. Yeah. Like, I think that the part in the ship, yeah, like, it has this weird, confused messaging going on, but it still would be an interesting kind of psychological story or, you know, to look at character-wise. And like you said, like, the the intro to this with the narrator like, would have been an interesting story on its own without introducing all of these different aspects. And the yeah. part on the planet could be an interesting story, too. But it's trying to fit all these together without really having a coherent thread throughout them that really drags this story down and yeah. makes it kind of hard to get through. A lot of this isn't the second half of the story. I mean, we're not quite there yet, but, like, there's a lot of names this is kind of one of the things where one of the criticisms of this kind of fiction is they're just throwing random names of stuff at you and you have to be like, I think I remember talking about this when we were talking about Out of a Silent Planet by C.S. Lewis. And I was like, he's naming all these weird things and we have to keep track of them all because we're trying to describe the story. And it's just kind of at this point in this one, in part two of this story, there was a lot of that. And I just didn't really want to be too meticulous about that stuff. Yeah. Because I knew it would start sounding weird. And I'm just like, I don't want to really say all those words. But I don't know. Yeah. We'll get to it. But that starts to pile on here. and <laughs> But we won't see that till we get to the... Out of the Silent Planet was one of the things I actually was thinking of during this the final arc thing thinking of it in comparison with how like the linguistic and the culture thing is set up and again with like the wells you can really appreciate somebody who has a talent for setting things things up as it reads better in the hands of somebody who is a little bit more i guess skilled with the prose because she yeah. does throw a lot of not necessarily linguistic stuff but she does do a little bit of the linguistics, not as much as the C.S. Lewis would get into, but, you know, she gets a little bit into the geography and the other things of the alien planet. It just, like, feels a little, like, awkward and stilted compared to uh, how C.S. Lewis or uh, Tolkien would have done it. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, like, Tolkien was a master at that. Lewis, (laughs) maybe not quite as much, but, I mean, I did get a lot of enjoyment out out of The Silent Planet. Even though I had some problems with some of that stuff and the way it wrapped up and everything, like it was a very obviously again there was a big religious message that oh, time yeah. too. Yeah, I still like that a little more than this in terms of just the writing and everything, though. Yeah, and, I, I and I things sort so of tying together. Yeah, and I think the reason why it doesn't work as well in the story 
is because it's like we have to pause the story so that you can get oh, this yeah. exposition. We have to pause the plot. It doesn't come naturally, which I think also right. can be compared to the bracket where you get the situation of the story really well integrated into the plot where it's like you get everything quickly everything kind of falls into place very well in in no yeah. man's land i mean we'll get we'll get yeah. the bracket more when we cover the story but she never yeah. data dumps on you no. and like it never feels like an info dump she, it, it always comes very quickly and you get it and it doesn't have to be like let's plateau the story so that you can hear this yeah and the thing with the bracket is like she could data dump on you. Like, right. there's this whole mm. backstory. The planets and the asteroids. and the, Right, yeah. it, it, exactly. Yeah. That we just, like, never get. And we could get an entire novel out of it, but we don't. But we it's just, sort of like, worked into the, it's worked into the plot yeah. of the story. And exactly, it's worked into yeah. it. And, mm -hmm. and that's the best way to do it. So yeah. you don't yeah. have to, like, your world building is integrated into the thing. And you don't yeah. have to. And the stuff that you bring up is important right. to the story. Yeah. Which yeah. sometimes isn't the case. Yeah. Sometimes there are things brought up that are never mentioned again. Or just, like, little asides. But they don't really have to be there. Yeah, and there's just, like, so many weird details like this. In this story in particular. Where it's, like, these things that feel like they're going to be significant. But they just, like, never appear again in the narrative. Yeah, like toothpaste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That just really stood out to me as such a weird addition. Like we make sure that there's toothpaste on the rocket ship. Well, like the whole thing that happened at the beginning. What happened to the ruby that was left in the narrator's fishing shack? I guess he used it later. I think it was mentioned at the end, but I don't really remember. I think because he came home to his wife, yeah. and his wife was like smelling his breath and going, "Have you been drinking?" And <laughs> It's like, no, but I got this really cool ruby. Yeah. <laughs> so it was mentioned, but yeah, I don't know. So Richard's fallen deeply in love with Dana, and Dana is distressed that now they must die up here. And Dana is a bit more positive and comforting, saying they should have at least to have a year until their supplies run out. And things get quite romantic. He tells of how he first learned she was a woman when they were kids and she went swimming thinking she was alone and unobserved but apparently he was spying on her so there's that that's another weird thing with the whole relationship between the two is like she's quite attracted to him even though he just tells her he was like watching her undress <laughs> I, I, I don't know like this whole scene unfolds really like weird and uncomfortably i think yeah well some people have weird preferences i, I uh, guess I I, guess. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have to necessarily buy it 100%, but I guess I buy it enough. I don't know. Yeah. Exhibitionism. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they think they're going to die because they've shot out so far past Uranus now. But it turns out there is a brewing, a small planet on the edge of the solar system. It really sounds cold and uninhabitable, but there's actually a special sun that it has that's essentially for that part of the solar system alone. And there is a gravitational whirlpool that pulls them in, and they think they're burning up due to impossible friction. The speed meter shows near the speed of light, which is impossible. Indeed, a buoy has this other sun that kind of keeps it warm and temperate all the time, I guess. And there's some Abruian natives who see a falling meteorite that falls towards the ground, and this observing astronomer thinks that it's a man-made object. It explodes in the air, and on impact in a colossal fireworks display. But somehow, partially as a result of low gravity, the humans survive. And they only pull Dana out at first, though they lift her, like there's these two Abruians that come in with one of their flyer contraptions, and they rescue her. And the first word from Dana's lips is, DICK! And I'm sorry, I'm 12, I know, but this was just the funniest part of the whole story for me. Like, she's unconscious, practically, and she's, like, writhing around, and she's going, DICK! DICK! At this point, I'm like, yeah, the diminutive for Richard is a little bit unfortunate. Yeah. I don't know who picked that. <laughs> And he's just, like, referred to as Dick Door all the time, 
now. <laughs> and there's just some really unintentionally funny parts to this. There's definitely some very awkwardly worded lines. I honestly, I meant to kind of look down this rabbit hole, but I didn't. But when, like, the word dick became the euphemism that it is, because I think this is totally unintentional. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it made me giggle every time like a 12-year-old idiot. Um, so they quickly realize that there's a dick down there too. So they circle back, but some barbarians have shown up. And the one younger guy, Ubka, he looks for dick, but finds what he thinks is a barbarian instead. It's the skin color, you see. That's what gives it away. So they conclude that he's undesirable, and they leave Dick behind. And this is where Sadak says, And that's how they came to a brewery. And he's ready to finish the story right then and there. But the other guys won't have it. But there's some really, really bad writing at this part. This is like where the the writing definitely, definitely, definitely could have used some polish. Like this part in particular, this whole section was just like, Oh, like the, just trying to get through this part. And I again, I just kind of feel like maybe if somebody, if she had some beta readers or, or something, I don't know. I don't know. It just, it's, she could have really done better with this. There's some really weird exposition. There's really weird, like, prevarication where the, a Bruin guy doesn't really want to tell any more of the story, but there's no reason for him to hide anything. He's just kind of like, yeah, it's too late now, and we should go to sleep. And I, I don't know. It's just, it's really bad. It's it's. <laughs> <laughs> the data dumps here are not well done at all. Yeah, and Sadak, he's like, yeah, 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 it's too late. We don't want to. We don't want to hear more of this. And yeah, well, I think also you maybe this is in defense perhaps but we do find out his identity later on yeah yeah we do and that yeah. could possibly like him not wanting to say anymore. that's a really good point could that's be really like kind of him being ashamed of what he's done yeah but of course it's, it is like the thing is is you you don't know that going through it so it you kind of don't have that ability to connect it because yeah. the writing doesn't really have you connect it. No, no at this point, yeah. not at all. Yeah. You're very right about that. That does seem to be like that. That is a good way of looking at it. And I yeah. almost didn't think of that. And I should have because. Well, I think that maybe if it had been executed better, it would have <laughs> been more clear. But yeah, I think that is still something that she was trying to attempt there. It seems like that plays a big part in the sequel as well, because his mm. thing comes back and his feelings of love for Dana. But anyway, we're spoiling yeah. <laughs> the great revelations to come. <laughs> the narrator, who never gets a name, and Professor Rollins and Elsie and the Abruins go swimming in one of the pools the Abruin use. And the men are described... And the Abruian men are much finer specimens than the Earth ones. Sadak reads the narrator's mind. And I don't think I even mentioned before that they could do that, but they're telepathic. And I think, again, that's kind of mentioned in the story in a very, like, late kind of way. Like, it's like just kind of, oh, yeah, did I tell you they can read minds? They do. Yeah, though it seems to be more of like a practice skill. Like, some are way better at it than others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's just like the way it's introduced. Yeah, is, right. Uh, yeah. But this Sadak is apparently a master at yeah. reading minds. And so he reads his mind and he talks about how they like to oil up their bodies. And then they don't respect bronze skinned men. And they say that the well oiled body gives evidence of a well working mind. So that's a really important motto on Abroy. After the dip, the narrator feels amazing and refreshed, and his shoulder injury is healed. And this is because there's radium in the water, just like there's radium in the sun of our Babui, <laughs> <Right. laughs> which was thought to be a dead satellite at one point before the core of it turned into a giant furnace and began to provide the conditions for life to emerge. Yeah, I do like the fantasy cosmology here. Yeah, it's pretty mm -hmm. cool. So we got some of the background of a Babui, and there's three races, the Tibora, the those are the silver men who are civilized and dominant, and the slave race, which is the Moata, who provided the Tabora with all their culture, apparently. And then there's the Gorans, who are the barbarians, and they're 
fearless and superstitious. And they figure the Gorons will just kill Dick. And this is what Moro White, who is the leader of the Taborans that have sort of rescued Dana from her fate of dying in the desert or whatever. He has ambitions of ruling the planet, apparently. So the rumors are that Mora is not born as normal men are born, but was created by an ancient order of scientists. And the, just one of the million things that she just kind of brings up out of the blue. So there's this like random group of scientists. There's a reviled sect of scientists who are unethical and they're hunted down and destroyed. But they might have given their brains to this Mura before they were killed. <laughs> so he's the best mind reader around, too. Sound familiar? Maybe. Oh, I just mentioned that, didn't I? So <laughs> low in the rank of nobility, though, he's hated by his superiors, supposedly. And Mura stares into Dana's mind as she dreams of war and Earth. She's thinking of the First World War, which, of course, she served in, which we shouldn't forget. Ukator is the younger one, and he's uncomfortable. Mora mesmerizes and attempts to implant things in Dana's brain. Yeah. He also does use his powers to calm her down because he doesn't want to deal with a hysterical woman. Yeah. There's, yeah. like, a whole bunch of lines around this part where they're totally shocked that they would send a woman unsupervised on an <laughs> interplanetary voyage and they have to like specifically point this out many times like how crazy is that yeah it's, it's kind of weird i don't know i think this was definitely something that interested leslie stone because it seems like the sexual liberation angle is something that she pursued later on and not just in terms of that but like the conquest of gula is supposed to be about Venus, which is ruled by women, and which the Earthmen invade, and the women have to kind of counter that, and they're a race of telepathic women, and that's cool, but it just seems like this maybe this whole thing was something that she wrestled with a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like, the role that Dana plays in the story, it definitely seems that way. There's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of, like, awakening stuff with her and how her relationship with Dor plays off as well as her relationship with the Abruian characters who yeah. are like constantly aggressively pursuing her against her will. Yeah. So he's sort of able to convince her that Dick is dead, even though he knows now that the thing Ubkator was actually, the thing he found was actually him. And he was the person that she's so eager to find. So Dana seems resigned to her fate and she offers the alien men cigarettes and chocolate. And it seems like a mistake, maybe, that she would do this, because she doesn't know anything about them. But there's no fire on a brewery, apparently. So their technology seems to have developed very differently from humanities. But Stone makes us see that it's parallel in some ways. So Muro wants to bring Dana to their king. And his ambitions and evil are unknown to Tora and unsuspected by Dana. It is a minor point, but I really do like how they pull apart the cigarette and send the tobacco to some kind of lab to analyze exactly what's in it. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was cool, too. It was like, mm -hmm. and, and this guy, she's kind of describing how these people, how various members of the society react to her and her the things she brought. And, like, the one guy's, like, devoting all this land now to growing something that's like tobacco. And selling it to the Abruians, I guess. Yeah, it's a good capital. <laughs> right. Meanwhile, Ukator seems to be developing a thing for Dana as well. So we talk about the houses at Duwata, which is the main city where most of the key Taborans live, I think. And the houses are uniform, one story, and glass roofed. And there's more descriptions of Taboran society and architecture and the plane they've been traveling in which is it's kind of one of those, like, yeah, here's the dimensions of the thing. It's, it's, it's like very, it's quite specific and weird. Kind of what you were describing, Nate, almost with the parody thing. Right, it's yeah. Not, maybe not quite that bad, but it's it's still kind of like, oh, she's spending a lot of time talking about this plane, right? As they descend, Mora throws a bunch of flowers at the assembled people. Flowers that the Obkator guy pulled from cupboards somewhere. So it's kind of funny, you know, it's like, 
hey boss, here's a bunch of flowers. Your people are eager to see you. So she makes a point of that, whereas like the underling is the one that's actually retrieved the flowers. It's not this guy. Then we get the chapter of the movie on a brewery, <laughs> where everyone gets to see Dana's ordeal, and this really, really reminded me of the Marco Deep, yeah, which was published the same year. Right, yeah. So I don't really know. I guess it's a coincidence, but yeah. this part was very, very similar. Yeah, pretty much the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. She so she's just there in front of all these people, and she's using her mind to display something on a projector that shows what happened and all the people are watching and going, Ooh, you know, like yeah. that's <laughs> incredible. And like, yeah. you know, and then this is what was happening in Atlantis in Arthur Conan Doyle's story. So I don't know. That was kind of cool. I mean, I don't know. Marico deep was sort of a bit more fun story than this one, I guess, but uh, yeah, I would say Marico deep was a lot better. But... Yeah. Well, that's kind of neat. So we get more about Abrui. It's kind of like random bits of information. Weird sounding place. Like there's only one bird species of bird apparently. And there's no audio transmission anywhere. There's no like radio audio transmission. They transmit pictures and text, but no audio, which is a really interesting thing to focus on, I think. Yeah, no, she brings them the radio technology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So there's also an island called Aura where all the thinking and academic stuff goes on. And it's independent of all other nations, of which Tuwata or whatever is the strongest. I don't know. <laughs> Dana is held by the royalty and she's given her own palace. And Mura is allowed to live there too, somehow. So everyone wants to look at her and women because they want to see a woman from another planet. And how she lives. And men because they like her coloring, apparently. The men form an earth club of sorts. And there's some English learning. Like learning of the English language. It's becoming a fascination. And cigarettes are becoming fashionable. And she gets her own cadre of female guards. And Merle White wants to take her on a world tour. Meanwhile, she wants to work on a radio to contact Earth. And... Mora is quite happy with her around, and he's rising in stature. So, the tour that they go on is apparently a really long one, and Dana makes it a particular point to talk to women and learn about them. And they seem fairly on equal status with men, maybe. They can do any work they want, and that's good. So, Dana keeps in shape, and meanwhile... We learn that the barbarian Gorons are uprising, and they are raiding the civilized lands like Vikings. And Mura is upset by all this, and he tries to reason with the Goran king, but he's not that interested in doing much in terms of allying with him. Now, we discover that Richard Dor is in fact alive this whole time, as we thought he would be, and he's been helping the Gorons. Mura wants to mate with Dana, and he doesn't want her to know all about Richard and what he's been doing. So, meanwhile, the radio hasn't worked out, and Dana is getting depressed. And she doesn't want to marry any of them, and she's had many, many propositions from the Tabora men. And she thinks all night of nothing but dick. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mura plans to make her his bride and then lure Richard Dorr in to kill him. There's no more Earth fan club since all the men left disappointed because she wouldn't marry any of them. <laughs> so she, she even said something along the lines of like, what's with all these men on this planet? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of funny because I can kind of see what she's getting at here. Like it's almost, there is a certain amount of legitimate social commentary in all this, I think, you know, but it's, 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 Maybe not as well expressed as it might be, but it's here, kind of, so. Mura insists that Dodans have to take mates. That's part of their social order. It's their duty to the state. But Uqua seems to really love her, and he doesn't ask for anything in return. Does that she not marry Mura? Because he hates him now, apparently, even though he was like his disciple earlier. And for some reason, this makes Dana respect Upka more. So he also gives her hope that Richard might still be around somewhere. And he goes to Gora to try and find out news of Richard, while Dana goes to Aura, the island of the educated people. 
to try to escape Moro's prying mind. Dick, indeed, lives. And Gora is making ready to war, and Uka has a serious conflict of interest on his hands. Don't worry, says Dana. Dick will come to me. And he does. He and the Gora have made plans, and the Moata, the Goldskin slave race, are about to be in revolt as well. So Richard wants to go back to Gora alone, but Dana scoffs at this, reminding him of her hardihood and the fact that she served in the British Army during the First World War. God damn it. So don't treat me like this. Yeah, I, I love that she's gone through like the horrors of the First World War. And yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, like she was an actual soldier. Yeah. So I think she knows yeah. how to take care of herself. And so this is like, this is kind of why, again, this is weird. Like, because she's done all these things, but now like she's kind of this like domestic going on this world tour. Like, I almost think she should have been the one to be with the barbarians. Yeah. I don't know. She should have been the one to be hey, you guys have been treated like crap for all this time. We should join forces. I can help you kind of thing. But no. Yeah, I don't know. It would have been interesting to see her leading a revolution. But... Yeah, this whole yeah. arc of the story is just like really confused and it, in my opinion doesn't work at all. Mm. <laughs> Again, to come back to the mummy, it reminds me of that in like it transitions into this like historical romance that is like kind of confusing yeah. and hard to follow at times because I don't know, there's just like so many different factions and she doesn't really get into any of them or like why you should care about them. This is like stuff that happens and this is like the final half of the book more or less and uh, I just felt that this part was like very unsatisfying overall. <laughs> well, I mean, I was okay with it when it wrapped up, but I was eager to get to that point. You yeah. know, like I, I think it did everything it needed to do, but I was just like, yeah, alright, 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 let's Let's get to the end. Like, that's... It was just too much. I don't necessarily feel that it was unsatisfying. I just think it wasn't very well written. But what we learn now is that Dana has this slave girl called Dura, who looks just like her, almost, except she's a different skin color. And so they decide to paint her up and send her in Dana's place to Aura. Hopefully, the trick won't be discovered. Indeed, Moore shows up at Dana's in the morning and gets a glimpse into her unguarded mind. And he has made a treaty with the King of Gora, supposedly, with food and clothes and luxuries for mining rights. So Richard is a renegade, and it's like, here's where we get this weird thing where it's like, Submit, Dana! Your lover's life or your hand in marriage! <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> what? I mean, I don't doubt that this kind of thing could actually happen, but it's just so funny. You marry me or I'll kill the person you love. Like, <laughs> yeah. Wow, my future looks really great. <laughs> Mura kind of makes like the grandstanding scenery chewing speech, which I thought was pretty cool. And the treaty is a kind of sham, as the king of Gora was advised to accept any terms while they prepared for war. And that was what Richard said. So, but Mora and Dana are to be married the next day, and Richard wants, he waits for her, I don't know, I guess they made some kind of arrangement, I think, and <laughs> he waits for her, but she doesn't show up, and Mora has now stunned her with the power of his mind, so she can't really do anything. But Dura, the slave girl, disguised herself as Dana, and Dana is Dura, so there's that, and just as the substitution is arranged and Richard is about to leave, Moore shows up and starts taunting him. And he said, there's no such thing as divorce among Taborans, by the way, just so you know. So there'll be criminals under God if something happens. Now, Dura is appearing lifeless and Richard asked if she would die for her mistress and she said yes. So at this point, I kind of thought, oh no, like, did she kill herself or something? But no, suddenly, though, Mora is struck with grief, and he seems honestly upset. But never mind. Dick is captured, Dana revives, and Dura is fine. So, Dura plays her part very well, and Richard is taken before the king as a despicable spy and sentenced to death. But he hears words in French from Dura. She waits for you. 
and Mura spirits Dura off to a private estate somewhere, thinking he's going to break Dana's will. But he doesn't know he's got the wrong girl. And then Dana opens her eyes. And they're the wrong color! And then the slaves start their revolt. Just at that time. It's perfect. And they steal all the planes and airships right then and there. And Dura threatens Mura with a revolver and escapes with the other slaves bound for Gora. And now, somehow, although maybe unsurprisingly, Mura gets the blame for all this. And he's demoted back to being a white which means he's not as good as a Tor, which is like the upper class nobility of Tabora. And Richard discovered a solution somehow deep in the vaults of Dewata. It's a kind of substance that resists the death ray that the Taboran people have. So everyone and everything in their army is painted with this <laughs> paint. Conveniently. It's just so yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> it's like a paint that basically repels the death ray so yeah. it won't have any the effect property of reflection it's like a net hack yeah it's a like, refracting of the light i guess yeah. but, uh, and it's the only weapon that the taboran people have meanwhile the gora now have guns and cannons and hand yeah. grenades and stuff like that yeah so the battle is pretty quick Tabora's defeated and it cedes most of its lands to moata and gora at this point i was thinking then why is there still a slave in from the beginning of the novel with these two yeah. Abruians. Like how yeah. of course we get into like I guess some slaves just wanted to be slaves still, so I guess that's why he's there. So my feeling on this is that some of these stories were written so quickly and I don't really think that she knew like she submitted this in two parts and I think she had no idea yeah. where she was going to go with it in the second part. I think she, when she started it... definitely it, feels that way. I mean, yeah. it's so disjointed. And this whole second half, it just really, really drags. Yeah, so Dick Dorr is some big leader now. And Sadak, their tired host who didn't want to speak this entire time, is, in fact, more a white. <laughs> He's free of the curse of his ambitions and now is good-natured. And Elsie and Ezra go off into space. Ezra doesn't make it far, though, dies soon after. But Elsie seems to like Aproy. The narrator gets dropped off. No one believes a word of his story, and his wife flames the whiskey. And that's that. <laughs> That's it, guys. That's the story. Radium Age, Radium Tech. Yeah. Radium um, Age is a good way to describe this. It's flawed in a lot of very obvious ways, but it does have its charms. And yeah. it does bring up some interesting things that, of course, they could have been better in the hands of a better author. But Right. I, I mean, I do think this is a good case for arguing that sometimes having a collaborator might be smart. Yeah. And, and some writers did. They worked as a team. And it seems like... I don't want to say that Leslie couldn't write a, a good story on her own. Maybe she does, but uh, I don't know. I just feel like a lot of the ideas here are cool, but it just they need to be focused more and they need to be written with a little more patience and style and just kind of, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just never comes together in the way it shifts gears on you. Like, it just kind of kills any kind of sense of pacing or like tension building or anything like that where nothing really feels like it gets going and when you get into like the main plot or so it's already like halfway through they, yeah. they don't even land on a brewery until like 
literally the halfway point, and then the rest of it focuses yeah. on this like weird historical kind of like medieval like romance type plot. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard to imagine even like a lot of the amazing readers being into that stuff. But apparently, a sequel was clamored for, and so the following year she wrote one, which was three parts long. Yeah, right. Two. <gasps> <laughs> Yeah, well, not on my list to read, but, uh, you know, I, this, this, this is what I'm, it wasn't my favorite, but I'm glad I read it and got some interesting stuff from it, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that we got to discuss it. I think that's, this conversation was worth reading it. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, again, it, the concepts in it would be interesting on their own. If they were put together better, I think it could have worked or it could have, if it had been structured differently, I'm sure that. It could have been a really interesting narrative, but just the way that it was approached doesn't do it justice. Like, I feel like there's, like, three distinct short stories in here. Yeah. And they, they, they could have been better explored on their own, I think, rather than trying mm -hmm. to cram them all together. Even if they had maybe just cut out, like, the narrator's part. Like, yeah. if they, it could have been maybe a little better if it was, like, one less layer to deal with. Like, the narrator but, feels so useless at the end. It's like, why do we even have this, like, whole He doesn't setup? need to be there. Yeah. 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 He doesn't do anything. And, yeah. Like, I know that it's, like, that idea of, like, well, a narrator usually is, like, the audience's double, the person that doesn't know anything going into the situation, but, like, you could have just had the point of view maybe being from, like, the professor or Elsie or something. That would have been perfect. That yeah. already knows what's going on, but you just yeah. you just establish it better and with a lot more ease with that. But I feel like it also could have been a great short story with the narrator's story. Like, yeah. you know, he stumbles upon this, like, weird structure and he goes in and has this incredibly strange experience and then goes home to his wife who just thinks he's a drunkard on his fishing trip or, or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. She could have made that like a really fun story on its own. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, a whole bit of them being like stranded in space that could have been like a really intense, like thriller. Yeah. They're yeah. running low on supplies or running low on resources. There is this like weird sexual tension between the two parties. Mm -hmm. Like, how are they going to smooth that out? Yeah. But like, the, the parts just don't link and it shifts gears on you when you feel like it's going to get going in some way or the other and it just feels <laughs> like it kills all the momentum of what's been built up to that point and... yeah i feel like if like you severed each bit away from each other and yeah. maybe just added a little more to each one and had it be a complete narrative within itself, it would have. They would have been interesting stories. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's kind of weird for me because like the third part of the story with all the weird intrigue and stuff is almost like the part that I feel like I should really like, but it doesn't really. It it comes off worse than the other two parts. Yeah, th th that was like by far my least favorite part of the story, and I was just like. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't wait until it ended. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it, it yeah, wasn't, sorry, like, guys. offensively bad or anything like that. It just felt, like, so dull and by the numbers. All right, I've seen this kind of plot a billion times before. Yeah, yeah I mean, All like, right. when that came into The Coming Race by Bulwer Lytton at the end, like, it was very welcome. Yeah. A good addition to the story where it's like, yeah, it started to get, like, bogged down and nothing much is happening. And then he kind of introduced that part, and it was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I, I want to read more about that, and I want to know about that. I guess this kind of reminded me of that, but it was, yeah, it was not really as good as that. I mean, it was more triumphant and less sad, which was cool, I guess, but I don't know. I, I, I had problems with this, too. I think that if you hadn't already waded through two different stories that <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> may have been more interesting on yeah. their own, it would have been easier to read and it maybe would have been interesting but yeah and yeah, she wrote it's... this long ass sequel to it across the board <laughs> which mura is a big part of it and richard door is back and coming back to the earth and i don't know i only read the beginning of it so i, I think i read the first two or three chapters or something like that and that's it so far so mm -hmm. i don't know if i'll continue with it i kind of just wanted to see how much i would get through before we did the <laughs> podcast just to to see if I could comment on it a little bit. And it's really long, and I can't really say that much about it. Like, it seems to revisit some of the themes 
on characters. Mm. But I don't know how much it really adds to the narrative. I guess a buoy is a part of it, and there's some stuff about the sun and a lot of space travel, and Mora White comes back, and I don't know. But is this interesting that people apparently wanted the sequel? Like, it was apparently sought after. So, yeah, I mean, why not, I guess. I can see that we all kind of struggled with the story, and, and I think that, again, it's mostly a factor of the writing itself. Like, I think that if it had been done a little better, she could have tied all this together and made it into a really good novel. But again, like, it's just, I don't know if it's the format that's conducive to the fact that a lot of stories are rushed and they don't quite seem like there's not a lot of the editors doesn't really take it upon themselves to be like, hey, I really think you have a good idea here, but I just want you to kind of concentrate on specific matters and flesh out these particular parts more. Like, I kind of feel like that would have been something that came along later with Campbell. And that's kind of one of the reasons why people say the golden age is the golden age is because he actually wanted to take the writers in hand and be like, hey, I think this is great. But I want it to be even better. And here's my suggestions. Can you write it like this instead? The staff of Amazing didn't do that kind of thing. And they were only paying so much, which wasn't very much. And 40,000 words is a pretty long story for Amazing. I don't know how much the sequel is, but I'm guessing it could I think be... It's longer, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's three parts, three serial yeah. installments. So it could be like 60,000 words. So she probably got paid like considering what that magazine was she probably got a reasonable payment for that hopefully eventually hope, yeah and it's kind of interesting how this one was fragmented versus something like reanimator was fragmented yeah. because reanimator yeah. definitely felt like it was six different short chunks because it was published in six different installments whereas this yeah. one like the line is kind of like split right in the middle it interrupts the stranded in space bit a little bit but you have the narrator's story in the first half and then you have this weird medieval romance on another planet type thing like in the second half and the two don't really intersect but the only kind of connecting thread is them getting to the planet yeah and dick <laughs> right. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so i just want to read the end of the letter that i was quoting earlier from wesley and she's very kind through this letter. She's very complimentary, very positive. But there's one thing that she's not very positive about. And I, I like the way, I mean, I kind of like, but also laugh at the way she builds up to this. Because, again, she starts out very kind about it. And by the end, she's like really, really calling it for what she thinks it is. <laughs> and it's so funny. So here's what she says. Now, about the magazine itself, naturally... There are stories that appear from time to time that I do not care for, particularly. But I have not found a magazine yet that did not contain stories I do not like. I know other people must enjoy these stories, therefore I shall say nothing about that. The type of stories I enjoy most are those that deal entirely with science fiction, rather than the detective and stories of that ilk. However, I do note that the stories I like most are those that receive favorable criticism from the majority of readers, while those I do not enjoy are those that usually receive the slams. Lots of people have commented upon the illustrations of Mr. Paul, and most of them seem to agree that his drawings are quite vivid and most often in keeping with the stories. But I do wish your covers were not quite so lurid. In the first place, your readers do not need these over-brilliant covers to recognize their favorite magazine, and, on the other hand, strangers more often would hesitate in picking up a magazine so amazingly bound. He could expect nothing but trash in a magazine so glaringly covered. I would suggest that Mr. Paul restrain his imagination slightly in dealing with the cover. Why not design a more subdued illustration in more sober colors, one that could be used monthly, somewhat in the manner of the Golden Book? I think that a solid color, a quiet shade of blue or green or something like that, could be used with the name, etc., for the magazine printed upon it, and, if necessary, some mechanical or scientific form pictured as one might use a symbol or crest. I truly wish you would do something like that. I always do feel a little sheepish when I carry my new issue of Amazing Stories through the lobby of a hotel, and I have been told 
that others suffer in the same manner as I do, under a barrage of eyes as they try to sneak unnoticed with that blatant pictorial atrocity under their arms. Were we to have a vote, then I know that almost every reader of Amazing Stories would agree with me fully. Please, please, tone Mr. Paul down. <laughs> yeah, but... It's an amazing letter, and I love the image of her secreting the issue of Amazing under her arm or in her backpack, <laughs> like, covering her face while she buys it in the newsstand, like, it's an <laughs> issue of, like pornography yeah. or something yeah. like that and like rushing to some deserted yeah. space to read yeah. folding it in with like a newspaper yeah, or right. something yeah you know, nobody <laughs> could see that i'm reading this it's yeah and it's really awesome. funny too because she talks about like trying to get her husband to read the magazine and it's kind of like the opposite of what we kind of associate with this kind of thing is supposed to be what the boys read right yeah. and I guess the opposite of the picture that we would normally have, where it's like, yeah. the husband kind of has to, like, try to convince his wife that it's cool that he's reading this stuff, and these covers are nothing to worry about and stuff, and it's like, yeah. uh, I don't know, I, I kind of find that a little bit charming, that she's mm -hmm. kind of like, hey, maybe you would be interested in this, and he's kind of like, no, 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 baby, you just, you just read your magazine, oh, oh god, <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> I don't know. It's it's, yeah. it's funny. <laughs> yeah, because it's usually like, oh, I gotta get my girl into this when it's it's the opposite here, where yeah. it's like, I no, yeah. no, thank you. Yeah, and she's like, maybe these covers aren't helping. <laughs> <laughs> if it was something more subdued, <laughs> yeah, some subdued shade of blue would be really nice. Yes, <laughs> but I don't know. Just like her rushing through a hotel lobby to like read the latest <laughs> installment of the. Jules Verne reprint or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or like yeah. the weird cover with the Beta Posidonia prize winning cover. Yeah, right. It's exactly <laughs> like that weird, all that shit going on. That's a, a really ugly cover. Like, <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I going through some That's high a... class hotel in 1928 with that under your arm, I could, I could feel her pain there. Yeah. <laughs> you feel her pain? Really? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's a little silly that she worries about this, but I guess I get what you're coming from. Where you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> I just find it very funny that she's like even trying to suggest a color scheme and everything, and she's like trying yeah. to be like, <laughs> make it something quiet and nice, please. Like, <laughs> yeah, some nice pastels and. You know, something yeah. very gentle. Pastel blue! Like, <laughs> with a little bit of green on the borders, perhaps. Oh. Yeah, poor Paul. I mean, he does have a place in science fiction history, but he's not a master of the art. There would certainly be some future illustrators that are very well regarded. I don't know how many of them did stuff for Amazing, but like Virgil Finley worked with Weird Tales as well as with a bunch of the dedicated science fiction magazines and supposedly he did some really good art so maybe we'll talk about that in future episodes I'd, I'd definitely like to sort of highlight some of that kind of stuff if we can a little bit going forward yeah just because it's interesting <laughs> yeah i mean the illustrators of this episode i think it was mostly paul though later on the art department definitely expands in the 40s i think there's like yeah. five or six different credited artists by 1941 we'll, we'll get into that a bit later but mm -hmm. i don't know that kind of illustration style, it's cool, but, like, a lot of them don't, like, stand out as being, like... Good art. <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess some of my favorite illustration work in literature, not necessarily genre stuff, is when, like, the artist does it themselves. Yeah. So, like, Mervyn Peake's illustrations for oh. Titus Groan and Gorman Gas series, as well as... Thackeray's illustrations for Vanity Fair are just incredible stuff, and they really convey the spirit and tone of the works, I think, more than somebody else possibly could. And it's not that often where somebody is talented at the drawing as well as talented as the prose. I mean... Yeah, but in both those cases, those are authors who are also illustrating. Yeah. And 
I think there's a difference there too. And they're also incredibly talented authors. I mean, Thackeray and Peek are both masters of the English language, no question. Gretchen, you just got Gormenghast, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Have I, you read I it? I just bought it. I have not. Uh, <laughs> I bought it. <laughs> it's so good, Gretchen. It's so good. I got it for my birthday yeah. uh, a couple of weeks awesome. ago, so I have not had the chance to read it yet. You should. It's one of my favorite novels. So yeah. Mm -hmm really good it's pretty amazing yeah I, I was trying to describe earlier how it's like fantastic without dealing with the fantastic like it's the style is more fantastic than the actual events in a way like it's just it makes it seem like you're reading about something really really strange even when the setting and the characters might be described in a mundane way in a different book it's it's really odd it's an odd experience reading that for sure yeah and i i don't know if we could work it into the podcast i mean it just You'll see when you read all three of them that it's science fiction adjacent, but uh, yeah. It, yeah, it'd be by the third book. Yeah, it, it's difficult mm -hmm. to work in, but uh, yeah, it's some of my favorite stuff. And Thackeray is also, again, uh, in my very high top stuff. Yeah. Of any novel, I mean, Vanity Fair is just incredible. Well, I don't really have anything else to add about uh, Stone. I wanted to conclude with her, her letter there about the magazine contents and the cover because I thought it was pretty funny. But I think... I think with that, we can wrap up the business with her. I don't really have anything else to add. I personally might read a few other stories just to see where she went. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of sad to me that she seems to have had that negative experience. And I don't quite know the way she describes it doesn't quite seem to match up with the actual evidence, you know. And I, I kind of do feel like Davin has a point there with that where he's, why is she saying that when, I, I don't know, I don't know, I mean... Did she really get those comments when these particular editors were publishing dozens and dozens of stories by women and not and like being very happy about it and actually advertising it in the magazine like a positive thing? John Campbell, I mean, we will be getting to Lee Brackett, but Campbell actually published Brackett in Astounding before she made it to Amazing in No Man's Land. And he was very quick to correct a reader who... I guess called her Mr. Brackett or something like that. It was like, no, it's Miss, actually. And he was happy about that. And Horace Gold was happy to publish women writers. So why why would both those editors tell Leslie Stone, hey, women should not write science fiction? That doesn't seem to make sense to me. I don't understand how that could have happened. Are people really that inconsistent where they 100% say things that they don't necessarily believe or back up yeah. just to get a writer off their case or something. I don't know. I, I would say so, yeah. I mean, people are people. And yeah. when you're dealing with the publication industry and anything like that, there's always a human element to every aspect of the business dealing. And the magazine might not have an official policy of we don't accept women authors on the books, but if somebody's a sexist jerk and they're in a position of power and they want to be a sexist jerk because they don't, like you or for whatever reason then they're just going to do that and so they like they basically they liked all these other women but the thing is they were not necessarily women who were just toting the line like they probably had less social conservatism than stone did and yet they were happy to publish them i don't know it's weird i guess you're right though i think the issue is more is that they didn't take women authors seriously to begin with and if they felt like a particular story written by a woman wasn't like up to snuff or wasn't like a literary yeah. masterpiece they would use the sexist excuse to dismiss them and Campbell and Horace Gold were definitely less into the planetary romance thing than I guess Garsback would have been or where Leigh Brackett got her stuff published in Planet Stories yeah, which right. was all about that that yeah. was that was the domain of planet stories yeah and that's why kind of she became known as a writer for planet stories because that was like the home for her right but they were very very happy with her everybody loved her stuff and that was like kind of her home you know that she eventually found and when we get to her shortly nate you can read some of the letter that she wrote but you know she was very happy to be writing for amazing but it didn't end up being her home any more than astounding was her home she had a place where she ended up, just like Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith and Robert E. Howard kind of had their place in like Weird Tales, for example. Right. That's where they did most of their best work because that was where they could be accepted and that was where 
their readers liked to read them. I guess the point that I'm trying to get across is that somebody like a stone would have perhaps been judged by unreasonable standards that wouldn't have been applied to a second tier male author. You know, so like a second or third tier male author that is not a talented person might have gotten their story accepted in the magazine without having to deal with sexist comments as a brushback of why their story should not be accepted. You know what I mean? Like, you know, somebody from like a third tier author that gets rejected from Amazing that's a man probably isn't going to get a sentence or a line back, you know, like we shouldn't feel like men should be writing science fiction. You know what I mean? And if you don't, yeah. you don't have like a natural talent for pacing or plotting like a bracket does or something like that. And you're somebody like a stone who, all right, maybe your stories aren't the greatest and you're just like kind of randomly patching ideas together. The added sexist rejection on top of quality concerns might make you a little more discouraged than if that wasn't there in the first place. Like, does, does that make sense? Yeah, you make excellent points. I do kind of see that, yeah. I mean, maybe it was just sort of an excuse in a way to kind of, I guess, get her off their case. I don't know if she was really pushy about submitting stories or what, but maybe it, she just wasn't doing the thing that they wanted. She wasn't, she didn't find her place in the 40s, and that's just the sad reality of it yeah i mean i guess like the sexism wasn't like an active like policy on the books but rather like a background thing that permeated yeah. in like unconscious bias in cases like that i could definitely see that like working against somebody like a, a stone even if there were cases like the magazines publishing stories from women early on and i mean partners of wonder does a fantastic job of chronicling women's achievements yeah, and they list, like, hundreds of stories oh, by yeah. women writers. And then it's but hundreds. But here's the thing. It's definitely hundreds. 90% of them, I don't know who they are. Yeah, yeah. And that in itself is an interesting phenomenon, yeah. right? Because maybe we should know who these women are, but we don't. Right. They're there, but they weren't reprinted in the anthologies that came later, which is how everybody who did not read those pulp magazines, everybody came to know the history of American science fiction from those anthologies. And I think we're in a interesting, unique new age now where the everyday fan, like us here, yeah. our listeners can have access to a great amount of archival research and primary information on, the, on these stories where we can read them and reevaluate the various histories and chronologies. You know, er everything is accessible to us now yeah. in ways that it hasn't been before. We have the archives of Amazing Magazine. We can look at it yeah. the way it was. Yeah, pretty much everything right now at our fingertips. Whereas people who discovered any of this stuff after the 1940s could not. Right. <laughs> people discovering this in anywhere from like the 40s to the 2000s would not have been aware of any of this. And they would have probably assumed that Partners of Wonder mentions two big anthologies published in the 40s, which were the first anthologies of science fiction short stories published by major publishing houses. And they took all their stuff from the magazines of the time, and they were edited by two to four fellows who were around at that time, but were not actually editors of magazines. So their experience was different, and they did not publish that many women writers in those anthologies. C.L. Moore was one of the few. Stone's Conquest of Gora did make it into one of those anthologies, which is probably how it managed to become a little bit more popular than all of her other stuff. And yeah, like that was seen as being representative. So people didn't know about L.T. Hansen. People didn't know about Stone. They didn't necessarily know about Claire Winger Harris. They didn't know about a lot of these other writers, right. many of whose names are unfamiliar to me. That in itself is interesting. That is actually like a more contemporary bias. Like it's a bias that comes from decades following, like starting in the 40s and 50s, where stuff was getting reprinted, but it wasn't these women's stories that we're talking about now. It wasn't these stories that we can look at. And maybe some of them were really good. Maybe some of them weren't. But because of the pool that the anthologies drew from people just sort of assumed that those writers didn't exist when in fact they did exist and they were there all along all right well i don't really have anything else about 
Stone, and I think that we have three more authors to cover. So let's take a quick break, and we will next discuss The Moon Woman by Minna Irving, also published in 1929. 